Well, um, welcome, Marnie. We're glad to have you here. We're kicking off our phonics lit lab, so we're excited that you could come tonight and share with us. Um, I do have some background information about you. Do you want me to share, or do you just want to go ahead and get started? Well, you know, I'm happy to just to say a quick uh, who I am That's myself. You know what? I would prefer that. Would you mind just okay. talking about yeah, your background? Just sure. So, um, I was probably like a lot of you, I was a classroom teacher um, who realized that her students were behind and I didn't know how to teach reading. And that was in the 90s. And so I searched everywhere to try to find something that would work. And it was really conflicting. How many of you have felt that when you go and look for answers, you're like, this is this people tell you, tell me this. And these people tell me that. Right. There's and so much of it. Yeah. And they disagree. And so I finally found something. I used a program called Phonographics. It was in the book Reading Reflex. I found it at Barnes and Noble. And it made a big difference, particularly for two kiddos who could not even read like hop on pop. They were in sixth grade and they were. Um, so that kind of got me obsessed about this ever since. So I tutored kids and that um, led to getting kids. Well, I, I, I started tutoring because I realized this is a big deal. Why was I not prepared? And why did I figure it out for these kids? Although they were only, you know, like at the third grade level by the time I was done. And then I started getting more into it. And so I wanted to tutor privately. And because uh, I was, I was so frustrated with my kids were at sixth grade grade level, but their reading level was here. And that wasn't what I was so my job was not really supposed to teach them beginning reading, but that's what they needed. And so did private tutoring. My kids were getting to grade level on average in about 12 hours, um, even struggling readers, kids with disabilities. And so that made me really curious, like, why was this, why was I not told this information? And so I went to the grad, I went to grad school to get my doctorate at the University of North Carolina. And um, <clears throat> then I realized that I wasn't told that information because of there's basically wars about how reading is supposed to be taught in the field. And so the stuff that had helped me came out of one field, the stuff that was mostly teaching teachers like myself was another field. And I did learn a lot from that field for, I indeed did, but in terms of how to kit, how to crack the code and learn how to decode to become uh, automatic with word recognition and then to become fluent, I did not learn that um, even when I had my master's. So, and um, <clears throat> then that doctoral work actually led to a, a kind of quirky thing for me to create an intervention with kindergarten and first grade struggling readers that was funded by US federal funds. And that was a very rare thing too. And that got effects, it's called the targeted reading intervention. And now they're calling it targeted reading instruction, still going strong, multiple journal articles coming out of that. And in fact, the US IES Education of Ed Institute for Education Sciences director recommends the TRI for ongoing replication because it gets good effects. So that was all cool, but it didn't actually change practice. <laughs> it made good, it was good journal articles, but other than the, the schools and we were that we were in, it didn't make a difference. So that's when mm -hmm. I decided to switch over to try something else more grassroots and develop Reading Simplified. So Reading Simplified is really based on the learnings uh, from that previous program and a lot of the same activities. If you looked at the targeted reading intervention, you recognize a lot of the same activities, which I'm going to show you this evening. And so that's what I've been doing now. Reading Simplified is just a way to teach reading in an efficient way, um, particularly how to crack the code and become fluent. So I'm going to be sharing basically tonight a lot of the things we've discovered um, with Reading Simplified. Yeah, I'm excited to hear. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to say hi to those folks who were really kind and said hello. Thank you. And then we'll get into this presentation, which I'm get getting ready on my computer. Thank you all for being here. We're going to be talking about how to make phonics stick. <laughs> Does that sound good? Um, that's probably the hardest, one of the hardest things it may feel like, particularly for those who are struggling. Yeah, people who were noticing that Facebook was down today, kind of scary. So I'm glad that to see um, Ingrid and Anna, some faces that I recognize and welcome. If I don't know you, um, Donna is here from Vermont and Dana in Indiana, welcome. Maureen is on the West Coast, Ashley, also in California, West Coast, Kim from Canada. Diane is coming to us from Belleville, Ontario. 
Um, so what do you guys teach? Are you, how many of you are teaching, you know, little kids? Are you teaching older kids that are struggling? Let me know where you are for that. Kelly's coming to us from Madison, Wisconsin. Awesome. Did I just move from there? Brittany to Colorado. Um, Brandy, also in Wisconsin. Welcome, welcome. And Kanisha, did I say that right? I love that spelling. You're in Fuquay, Verena. I know where that is. I used to live in Durham and Carborough. Andrea, okay, so thank you for sharing. Okay, K5 intervention elementary. Okay, okay, one. So we've got, okay, good. When you, when you work with a lot of different kids, you really need efficiency, right? You cannot have something, you can't reinvent the wheel for every grade level at every reading level. Courtney, I didn't know you were doing kindergarten or are you a teacher too, or are you working with your own child? No, I'm a kindergarten teacher. Okay, lovely. Okay, Brittany's with first grade. Okay, so thanks for sharing where you guys are um, and what you teach. So let's get into the promise of today. I said it's going to be making my cursor stuck. Oh, making phonics stick. Okay, here we go. I got it. Let's do this. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. So my first question to you all is, um, what's the hardest part about teaching phonics? Can you share your answers in the chat? I can find the chat. I lost it. What's hard about teaching phonics or getting words to stick or sight words that kind of actually I'm going to make, make a case that they're all kind of related. What's hard about teaching phonics? Perfect. So true. How many of you have found this? Even with explicit instruction, the students don't always remember. <laughs> blending and segmenting. The vowels, they're nasty. Our language is not nice to the beginner. Brandy says keeping it engaging. And the, 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 the rules like CK and floss and one grapheme can represent multiple phonemes. And the reverse is true, right? One phoneme can be, have multiple graphemes. Very tricky. Especially now with math, how do you do? <laughs> what vowel is that? It or eh? <laughs> yep, the various levels that kids enter our classes at. Indeed, that's very, those are all issues. Anna says it's hard when kids try to learn a phonics in isolation. She's speaking my love language, so she knows that. So we're going to talk about that. Okay, so those are things that I have experienced too, and we're going to hopefully knock out a lot of those problems um, today. Okay, the big, <clears throat> the other thing I should ask you guys actually a question is, um, how long have you been on this journey with, which is now being called science of reading? So I know where we are. We might have people that just heard about the science of reading yesterday. We might have heard of, have people that did, um, have been researching this angle before it was called science of reading. Courtney, thank you. So two and a half years, seven, Brittany, one and a half, two, two. Okay, first year, Donna, welcome. Okay, so some of this may be a review for some of you. Six months, lovely. We're so glad you're here. Three years, there's whether, I mean, we're thrilled. I know we're thrilled if it's your first day. Um, Lily completed the letter training 10 years ago. Okay, so some of this may be a review for you. And um, it sounds like a lot of you, it'll be a review. So maybe I'll go a little bit faster through some of the theory because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and, um, because the activities that I'm going to present, they come out of this foundation. Yeah, a long time. I feel like I taught like this before, says Kim. Okay, so my first question, the reason that we're going to bring this, the, the theory is going to come out of this mismatch that is of what people think is common sense to what actually has happened. So a lot of times we think that if we need kids to learn important words like said, that we should just show it to them and that they will learn it. And especially if they already know, it should not be that big of a deal if we give them this card enough because it's visual, they just see it several times, they should learn it, right? And that seems to be how kids learn to read on the surface of things, but um, we know from a lot of research that actually reading is not visual primarily. I mean, we have to use our eyes and there's a lot about visual processing that's involved, but getting started on learning 
to recognize a word like this, it actually depends heavily on the processing of sounds, of the, the sounds of our language. And that is a really big aha that researchers have revealed to us in the last 40 to 50 years. And it transforms the way we can more effectively reach our students. So if we emphasize this word, um, that it's three short letters and one tall letter, or that it's S-A-I-D, we're emphasizing its visual characteristics, which is again, common sense, and uh, many people do this to this day, but and if, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for everybody. But if uh, instead we connect, it's said as D, make connections between the sounds that we hear when we say said and these visual symbols, that is going to be the way that the brain syncs this information and learns. So instead of it being visual, actually it's um, as the main driver, no, the main driver to kind of unlock the code is actually sounds. So learning to read is first based on our oral language ability. So even in utero, we know that the brain is, the baby brain is building their ability to understand language and individual sounds even. Um, and so on top of that foundation, reading is established and it, and it depends on good language skills. It depends on um, that as its foundation. But then when we get to the point where we're ready to actually teach words and letter sounds, um, it gets a little bit more complicated and we need to talk about the, the route to get there. So I'm pulling these ideas from a lot of research syntheses. You might wanna take a screenshot if, if you want, if you haven't read some of these books. These are some recent classics in the last 20, 22 years that have synthesized the research and they make a case for the way in which we learn the code is um, really important to get kids having a successful career as readers. So if reading is connected to language, um, the, the it, language is the foundation and then we build recognizing words on top of that, how should we teach um, reading? We should teach it in a way where we really connect to real words and sentences and text as much as possible. And how do we make that connection? It's really important for us to unlock the sounds in the words for the kids, because what is our code? It's specifically an alphabetic code. It is a code where individual sounds represent individual symbols. And the key to unlock this code is to process this individual sounds and words, these phonemes that this is and this is two letters. It's a two letter grapheme, but it's e. And this is d. So this is the insight, the alphabetic principle, the insight about that, and the skill of knowing that this is and knowing that this is e. That is how we're going to get kids to stick, have these sounds to stick. So really, the main thing we want to get phonics to stick and to get high frequency words to stick is to have that, that build off of the foundation of good language with strong sound-based decoding. And when I'm saying sound-based decoding, I mean phonological decoding, or let's attach the sound that we hear in the words to these particular symbols, and that's unlock it, sound symbol correspondences. And um, the, the uh, McClelland and, and Seidenberg processor, four-part processor is helpful with this. You can find this in Mark Seidenberg's book, Language at the Speed of Sight. So this is showing what's going on in the brain. The triangle is the main part of the diagram of meaning, phonology, and spelling. And let me break it down for you. This is how words get learned. We're going to go through a little bit more about what we know about how words are learned and then talk about activities. So let's take the top of that triangle. If I say the word cat, you all have a meaning, a concept of a cat. It's a feline creature. Then maybe the context in which I use that word would be some, like a sentence, like the cat is playful. Okay, so we can do that just without any reading, right? But then there's more to, to, that's involved to become a reader. We, to become a reader, we need to take the concept of a cat 
as a furry creature. I don't like these cats. How many of you like cats? I have a dog cat. There was my best friend and uh, cat when I was sleeping over her house, he would like swat at me and, and hiss. <laughs> I was like, that's kind of put me off of cats. <laughs> I was like in the middle of the night and I was getting swatted. I was like, I was nice to you cat. Anyway, that's the meaning of cat in my brain. <laughs> but what are the sounds of phonology? If I broke that word cat down, I would hear at. That's at least what I perceive as a reader. Those are the sounds that I hear. And then I'm going to, to become a reader, I need to not just perceive the sounds, I need to tie it to, to specific spellings or orthography. And so those, the, the k at has to connect specifically, very specifically with the C-A-T. And then that is how the reading brain starts to build the ability to sound based to code and then the, have the word become memorized. They call it orthographic mapping. So all of these pieces of the triangle are connected in our brain. When I say any word to you, you your brain has some residual connection to the meaning, the sounds, and even the spelling. And researchers have done some pretty cool stuff where they try to trick you and to see if you're, you're, you're noticing the phonology or if you're noticing spelling. And spelling really drives the way we think about words. If we're a reader, because we've gotten this process down. A lot of kids are struggling with phonology, like perceiving that cat is cat, or maybe something harder that stomp is that perception uh, make, is weaker in some kids, maybe as much as 40%. And when they have that weakness, then they don't know how to attach those sounds to those symbols. And so they don't have a strong sound-based decoding system. When they don't have a strong sound-based decoding system as a foundation, then words don't become memorized and then they don't become fluent. So phonology is a really big deal. And we wanna really draw kids' attention to how sounds and symbols phonology and spelling, phonology and orthography, how they relate. Here's another example of what I'm trying to say. This is how it all gets built. The system for reading gets built right here, that the child perceives that the letter R is R, the letters E, A, R, E, the letters D, the letter D is D. And it's, so it's the linking together of those phonemes and graphemes that builds the reading brain. This, the first, the child first has to just decode the word, then they have to recognize the word, um, then they have to decode it enough that they recognize it automatically. And then it becomes what Linnea Airy um, labeled as orthographically mapped. That's a fancy way for saying orthography memory having to do with correct spelling, the particular order of things. You decode the word cat maybe once, maybe twice, maybe four times. And then the next time you see it, you see it and recognize it so quickly, um, it's almost a miracle how fast that word gets recognized. It's faster than recognizing an object. If I hold this object up or I hold the word this, you'll see this faster and register this faster. It's unbelievable if the word is orthographically mapped. If it has been decoded and linked with sounds and symbols to the point and, uh, with sufficient practice that it becomes a sight word, a word recognized automatically by sight. So this is a really great paper if you can track it down, summarizing the literature. David Kilpatrick has also done a great job of, of kind of bringing these ideas out of the research world into our more common parlance as practitioners. So his, his book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing and Overcoming Reading Difficulties is there on the screen. And that's the one that brought this kind of concept, he's the guy that brought this concept more into the, the public domain, but Aries the one that did that work with, I mean, study after study, starting in the 70s, I think, year after year, just building the, with lots of little cool experiments, and she's still going at it. So in that paper, this is what she said. We, reading, in the science of reading, sometimes we might, we might think, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn, and there's, that's true. It can be complicated to teach reading, particularly to struggling kids. But at its core, to be able to learn to recognize words, it's, it's pretty simple. And this is the way she defined it, how to learn to read words. You first, you have to decode letters. Decoding letters into blended sounds helps readers figure out words they have not read before. 
rereading them a few times moves the words into memory. That's the orthographic mapping. So they can be read by sight, meaning in a split second, in the, in the milliseconds. So I wrote this down um, into a formula. Well, first of all, do you know what she meant by decoding? So blending phonemes or is what decoding to, is one step of the decoding process. So putting k f to blending them together, those phonemes, uh, which we tr we've translated graphemes into phonemes, and then we hear cat, that is all that decoding is. And she says it's actually not as complicated as we make it. Uh, she goes on to explain um, to be get, how do you get those words to be orthographically matched? She says, it's just three things. First, it, we have to get the students to have the knowledge and skills that enable connections to be activated when words are seen and read. And that's what I've been talking about. How do you connect sounds and symbols, phonemes and graphemes? This includes teaching the writing system beginning with grapheme phoneme relations. So they have to know that this is, s. they have to know that this is d. And then as they get a little bit more advanced and they have to know that this is eh, at least in a few words. So graphing phoneme relations, teaching phoneme segmentation, because that helps you crack the code. Because when I hear the word said, I, I can kind of hear the sounds and know that how, which sound maps onto each particular symbol. So phone, graphing phoneme relations or letter sound knowledge, phonemic segmentation, and then really importantly, teaching a decoding strategy. How are you going to put those sounds together so that you hear a word, a meaningful word? And then you got to practice it. And so that's all it is. <laughs> Here's those steps again. I just took her sentence there and broke it into those three steps. Graphing phoneme relations. Segmentation helps them crack up, crack up break open a word because um, with some other harder word you need to, let's see if I got a harder word here. Like this one's pretty hard, right? You have to, to segment the, the sounds are er, the three letters here is er, that's pretty weird. It's not regular, but that's how this decodes. This is how the sounds map onto the symbols of the phonemes map onto the graphing. So that was segmenting that helped me figure out how were is spelled, helps me learn the orthography, the spelling. And then you gotta teach a decoding strategy. So if we break that um, three part things into a visual, like a math equation, this is it, this is your formula. Now, aren't you glad that you're here and you know how easy it is and you'll go back tomorrow and life will be all good. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to how this will actually make a difference, I, I hope. Um, but the triangle, do you see on the left part of the diagram, the triangle processor, the meaning of the cat, the phonology of the cat, the cat, and the CAT, the actual orthography itself, the, all of that in, on the far left of that formula is the sound-based decoding. So connecting sounds and symbols unlocks a word. What do you have to do after you sound based decode? You have to practice it. And sometimes with as few as one to four times of practice, the word is automatically recognized. And that means it's be uh, become orthographically mapped or it has become a sight word. So that's our formula. And so then what do we do as classroom teachers or tutors or parents? What are the actions, activities that we wanna do to get this loop happening that, that we decode, we practice? So <clears throat> a lot of it boils down to, particularly with word study, to just making sure we're doing reading, writing, and manipulating words. So the activities that we did at the targeted reading intervention that I developed at University of North Carolina and the same ones that we're doing here at Reading Simplified, they do these things in a very integrated manner. And that's how we help build the sound-based decoding. Kids need to read words with a sound-based decoding approach. They need to write words and say the sounds as they do them. That's a really big part. We're basically at the same time, we're linking orthography and phonology, sounds and symbols all the time. When they write the word said, they should say s-e-d. That's linking that information. It's sinking it in their brains. Extra practice too for each letter sound. And we'll also show some examples of manipulation. Okay, so let's...
take a break there. So we're, we're basically my, the rest of what I'm going to present to you, I did a little bit about theory and research. Where is this coming from? It's not just coming out of the blue and not just out of my head. Um, and we're going to hold on to some of this kind of this principle. We just got to figure out the, the most effective ways to do reading, writing, and manipulating words. Okay. And I want to show you a video where it all starts. If you have a beginner or you have a kid who's really, really struggling, then you can start with an activity that we call build it. It's like the Montessori movable alphabet. How many of you have a Montessori background or have seen that work? And that actually, I think we'll also get into, after build it, we call it switch it, which is that manipulating. Um, some people call it word chains. So we're gonna do that. Watch this video of a boy Starting out his instruction, he's not had any letter sound instruction. He has had letter name instruction. He has not had any phonemic awareness instruction other than this week with this little series that I did with him. And he hasn't had any decoding instruction. So he, in this activity, he's mostly manipulating to help him lead the way and prepare the way for reading. Okay, so let's watch this, see what he's learning, see if those connections are going to be made. Sound symbol. Is he going to be prepared to do the sound-based decoding? Is he going to be doing what Linnea Airy said, learn letter sound knowledge, um, phonemic segmentation, and a decoding strategy? We're not really doing a decoding strategy here because I've given him the word, but we're doing the other two. Okay, so I'm going to share a little bit of this video. It's about three minutes, and then I'd love to hear some questions before we keep going further with some other uh, phonics activities. Okay. So let's see if I can share my screen again. Well, oh, there it is. Share sound. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound and see it? Okay, we have had, switch it to. Hid. Which one are we going to take away? You got it. Put it up over here. Get rid of the ah. What sound goes there to make hit? Hit is two sounds. What's after ha? Hit. Ha. And then what? And hit. What's that sound right there after the ha? Hit. 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 Which one is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you know you could make hid? Yeah. Tell me the sounds. Point and tell me. Hid. And the word is hid. hid. Now let's switch it to him. I know him. He's reading really well. Hid to him. Mm? Yeah, where does the, what sound do we have to take away? Yeah, we don't need the duck. But we need a... Mm. Yeah, him. Check the sounds and point. Mm. Oh, ha, huh. ha, uh. eh. eh. hmm. him. You made the word him. Okay, now we're going to add a couple things to our board. Some new things, new things. Let's make him turn into hill. We had to climb up a, a steep hill. It's the first time you've seen these you graphemes. Him. The W and the L. Switch L. It to hill. What should we take away? Him to hill. We need an I. Eh. We don't need the M. Mm, that's right. Okay. Now what sound goes there to make hill? Oh. oh. Which one of these do you think is O? Oh. Oh. Two, le two letters, but one sound. Oh. You made hill. Uh, check to make sure you've got it. Huh. Yeah. Uh. yeah, close. Let's go back. And then this is A. Yeah. Oh, look at it. Oh, okay. Now I want you to switch it to will. Can you? Will yeah. you switch hill to will? I can. You can? Hill. I think you can. You have hill. You need to switch it to will. will. Mm -hmm. What's that L. sound that's different? L. Well, we have an O over here. Look at the look at, at, at as I point. You have yeah. hill. We need will. Why? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. We need a whoa. Where are we gonna put it? 
At the beginning, that's right. Whoa. Which one do you think is what? We haven't done this one before. That's right. Whoa. Whoa. Good figuring. You made Will. Check it. Uh huh. I want you to separate these. Whoa. Oh, very nice. Okay. All right. So that was an example of build it and then switch it where he was moving sounds in and out. Um, so what questions can I answer or um, comments do you guys have so far? Anything? Some of you are reading Simplified Pro, so you could be teaching this now. So you may not have a question for me. But some of you may never have seen this kind of thing. Do you see how that can lay the ground, the foundation for sound-based decoding? How if the phonology is going to connect to orthography? That's what we we're doing. We're trying to build that foundation that we were talking about, so he could sound-based decode, so he could read words and recognize it. Kim says she loves switching. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we're doing a special event in October 18th. I'm going to give you the link later on if you want to sign up for the special event where I'm going to teach this activity in a lot of depth. And uh, we encourage you to test it out. Just do like five minutes with one kid or one small group, whichever you prefer, for five days. And you learn a lot about what kids are capable of. Um, Delia says she uses this activity, but I've always used it with familiar graphemes. Yes. This is one of the principles that we're, we, we embrace here at Reading Simplified. We're always throwing challenge at the kids, um, throwing something new at them that they haven't seen before. In fact, this activity that I just showed you is not just to figure out sound-based decoding and how sounds and symbols match up, not just for phonemic awareness. It's also a letter sound training ground. So we learn the letter sounds in that environment. Yes, it is. It is similar to Hegarty in that you're really diving into phonemic awareness and phonemic manipulation, which are, we know from research are very powerful things that kids need. But um, you're making the important point that it's putting the letters back into it, which is what research is showing us. And if you um, didn't catch Mark Seidenberg's series on this, he just recently did a, a three part series on phonemic awareness. It's, um, I'll put the link in, I highly recommend it because we've gotten some confusion um, in a, a lot of our curricula. And he is pointing out how, when we connect sounds and symbols, the kids learn to read. That's more in alignment with what the research has indicated. And Marnie, that's what we heard too in our last two lit labs that we had right. with Nora and Tiffany. Right, Courtney's got an elite crew here because not many people are, are teaching this, but so it's really great that you had Tiffany and Nora here to, to lay the groundwork. So that basically when you're talking about phonological awareness and you're talking about phonics there, they may be separate modules or thoughts uh, or concepts in your mind, but the reality of practice is they're completely integrated. Like, what did you see that little boy doing? He was, what's the beginning sound in will? And it was, wasn't it interesting. He wanted to say why, because what's the first sound that comes out of your mouth when you say, why? Because he had learned letter names first, which is why I prefer to learn letter sounds first, but he coped with that pretty well. But not every kid can. Marnie, did you see from Kelly, do you have the steps for each activity written and is it available? Yes, and that's going to be part of this event. Um, you can okay. get, I think you can get it on our, our website if you go to um, readsimplified.com forward slash switch dash it readingsimplified.com forward slash switch dash it, or you could just search for it and you'll find it. But also we're going to give you a lot more resources in that special event. And it says switch it is such a quick way for students to learn sounds and their letter connections. Yeah. Did I miss anything else, Courtney? Thank you for doing that. Okay. I don't think so. Oh, Great. someone said they started using switch it with nonsense words. Yes, that can be helpful for the older reader or the kid who's really advanced. That's what we recommend. We don't start there because if they don't know their letter sounds and they don't know how to read, then real words is, is what you want to spend your time on. But when you get to the fact, the point that they can do sprint, spr um, splint, and just do it quickly and they know their letter sounds and they're so advanced in their manipulation, then how can you increase the challenge? Well, one way to increase the challenge is to turn them into nonsense words. So you have spross, change it to sploss, change it to splus, change it to splest, and that'll keep pushing their phonemic manipulation, which helps them figure out more deeply how the code really works. 
So, so Marnie, nice. in, a, in my kindergarten classroom, would you be doing this with, you know, my, a small group or would you be doing it with the whole class or how do you see that going? Yes, um, you can do it in all those ways. Um, I like to do it for a typical classroom teacher. I suggest that they do it in small group that are grouped by um, similar skills, similar phonemic difficulty levels, but uh, we have people doing it whole group as well. And of course, when you have a really tough situation, if you can pull that child aside and do one-on-one, -on -one, even better. Um, and that's what we did actually at the targeted reading intervention. We pulled the, the, one of our five most struggling kids, we pulled him aside for 15 minutes for like once a day for like six weeks or nine weeks or whatever it took to get them up to par. And then we'd pick another kid. Okay, so back to this model. This is like, basically, it's, it's reading and writing and um, manipulating. Okay, but then I think the tricky part is, well, where do you start and where do you go from A to Z? Because the font, the, you know, it's this is really complicated, right? Sad is one thing, but where do I, where does the AI fit into it? And so we've broken the code down. We've actually followed um, Diane McGinnis's breakdown of the of how to think about the complexity of the code in just two quadrants. So basic code is the easy stuff. It's basic. It's just consonants, consonant digraphs, and short vowels. And a lot of reading programs already start there, right? And I think that's a nice, gentle way to start. We don't have really hard and fast evidence that this is by, from Mount Sinai, that this is the only way to do it. But um, that's what most programs do. And I think that's probably wise because you present the student with how a system works somewhat reliably and they start to get that decoding strategy. Remember, that's one of our three things, letter sound knowledge, phonemic awareness, phonemic segmentation, particularly and a decoding strategy. So they need to have some skill in decoding these simple three sound words. Um, but we don't want to stay there. Um, we want to keep moving. So after kids have been able to blend three sound words with short vowels, not to perfection, but about 70% of the time, then I suggest you move forward in going into advanced phonics. And what is advanced phonics? We don't worry about whether you're teaching long vowels or calling it a, an R-controlled vowel or a diphthong. You don't have to worry about that. You can just say, what are the sounds that are coming out of kids' mouths and the, the sounds that are high frequency sounds that relate to high frequency spellings? Let's just teach those under this umbrella category of advanced code. So an example would be in the long vowel, like O can be O is in go or O is in show or O is in boat, O is in note, O is in toe. But it would also be the er sound as in her, First nurse works early for a dollar. All of those have er sounds. So we try to push ahead there quickly because um, two reasons. Number one, the representation of the iceberg, like what's beneath the surface is so much greater than what's above the surface. And a lot of our reading programs, they spend all year in the first year of school learning just the short vowels and the consonants and consonant digraphs. And so kids get in a rut. They think that the reading, the way to read something is to see one symbol and know that it's one sound and it's predictable and reliable. And that's not true, right? And so if we get them into advanced code earlier, they'll get the concept about how our code really works. That's one reason. Um, but the other thing is just, there's so much of it to learn. We need to, to be able to become a good reader. You have to have a lot of advanced phonics knowledge pretty quickly. So because it makes more sense with, to, for how the code really works, and because there's so much more information down there beneath the surface, so to speak, we want to dive into advanced phonics as quickly as possible. So this is our rule of thumb at Reading Simplified. This is different from a lot of your reading programs. So I think you'll find that it's doable um, because advanced phonics is actually not that hard, especially if you keep it at the three sound level. The word boat is only three sounds. Um, it's a lot harder to read the word sprint if you've been taught a little bit of phonics information, advanced phonics information. So to talk about activities then, that, the reason I bring this up again, you know, it's okay, I'm gonna read and I'm gonna write and I'm gonna manipulate words, but there's so much to teach. What's the order? How do I think about it in my mind? Because it's overwhelming. If I think, personally, I think about, I've got the basic code and I want kids to get that, just like to I said, to, like I said, to about a 70% level. And then I, I wanna jump into advanced phonics as quickly as I can. 
So we've got only a handful of activities that allow you to do accomplish these goals. So these are the, the activities that we use at Read Simplify that accomplish those things I was saying. You need to read, you need to write, and you need to manipulate. So the first two are build it and switch it. You just saw that building it is where you don't have the complexity of switching. You just three sounds on the board. It's for the beginner. They learn about the alphabetic principle that way. They learn to, to do the earliest steps of phonemic segmentation and they learn letter sound knowledge. But then if you can, as quickly as you can go over to switch it where they have to change things, that's really going to push them cognitively, right? It's a lot harder to, to do sit to sat than it is to just start with three letters and build the word sit. The comparing and contrasting. Are we seeing, are we seeing, we're seeing the slide where it says, how can we rapidly help the child make these connections? Weird. Okay, I'm sorry. You're not seeing the right okay, slide. I'm still, we're still listening. <laughs> I, I was doing a great job with my slides over here, you guys. You just didn't know. <laughs> sorry. I was bouncing around. Okay, here we go. Let's try this again. So did you never see the advanced, the basic code and the advanced code? Right, we didn't see that. No. Okay, so sorry, you guys. Thank you so much for correcting me. This is the basic code up here above the ice, above the water level. And, and, and there's much, much more of an in the iceberg beneath the level. So I'm just gonna give your brain a chance to catch up since I didn't show you the visual I thought I was showing you. You get that advanced that basic code versus advanced code. And there's just so much more that's beneath the surface. And we got to get to that faster if we want kids to really read real words, because most of the words that are high frequency words need long vowels and they need the er sound. So, okay, we're going to try to aim for basic code first, and then we're going to try to push them into advanced code as soon as they can do most short vowels about 70% of the time. Just three sound words. Can they do cat and fit and sun? If they can do it 70% of the time, not perfection at all, then we're going to go into advanced phonics because we're still not going to leave behind short vowels. It's not like short vowels disappear when you're reading real text. And also with our activity switch, it, we always keep it at the short vowel level. So back to here, what do we do with the basic code when we're trying to introduce the code to the kids to make it fairly reliable so they get that decoding strategy in motion and they can um do this the triangle processor get them being connected with the phonology and the sound and the spellings and that we want that uh, you know that system to work that the third thing that Ari mentioned a decoding strategy so we start that skill at the basic code level and so what are the activities we need we're going to use these four activities these all these activities they do reading writing and manipulating so you already saw build it you already saw switch it but read it is very similar because um, we're connecting sounds and symbols, like phonemes and graphemes. But um, now this, the, the child has the chance to actually read the word. <laughs> and then write it is dictation. So uh, all four of these activities are going to help us accomplish the goal of reading, writing, and manipulating. And they're connecting phonemes and graphemes at all points. And together, these will build our students' knowledge at uh, at the basic code level, and it will build their ability to decode words. Of course, the other thing we would do is to read connected text, but in terms of word work activities to, pat, to es escalate our students, or accelerate our students' growth, these are the ways we'd go about doing that. So would you like to see an example of read it? It's pretty easy. And we use, for read it, we use what's called connected phonation, which that's only recently what it's been called by uh, Linnea Arian and her colleague, Gonzalez Frey. But um, I call it blend as you read. Some people call it continuous blending. How many of you have heard of that, those ideas? Let's see, blend as you read example, okay. I'm gonna check the chat. Lily, thank you for pointing that out. I wish I'd seen the chat. Okay, you have heard continuous blending. So what you're gonna see here in this example is um, the opposite of segmented um, decoding or segmented blending. So a lot of programs will say, let's read this word. Yes, let's read it, let's break it down. It's e e s. Now what word? 
How many of you have had a program where that was the way you did, were taught to do it? And you're, maybe you even tap it, yeah, eh, s. That is very common. And Gonzalez Frey and Ari and some people in the 80s have studied this and said that doesn't actually get us as much bang for our buck as when we say, as we put the sounds together, as we go, as we connect them. So instead of doing it that way, we would get the child just to say the first two sounds. Put those first two sounds together. Yes, yes. It's a very subtle thing, but it's huge for our students who are struggling. So this is um, putting that decoding strategy into play in this activity we call read it. It's got two parts, two main parts, maybe three if you count the erasing. The child reads the word, the child writes the word and says the sounds, and then the child erases them and says the sound. So it's just another reinforcement of segmentation and letter sound knowledge. So watch for how he blends. This is a kid, kindergarten student who was struggling, who had a speech difficulty, so which may, means that, it's, you know, usually that means you're going to have trouble with reading, um, at least at the beginning, or more likely to, I should say. So he's coming right along, a blending a four sound word, because he's using the blend as your read strategy, or continuous blending, or connected foundation, whatever term you'd prefer. This one's kind of quiet, so you might want to increase your volume. And it's short. Okay. Let's put these sounds together. Okay, what are the first two sounds? Um, put them together. Put all three together. Nice. Okay, great job. You put the sounds together. Now say each sound. Beauty. Okay, let's erase and say the sound. Can I read through this one? Sure. You want to fix your ah? Yeah. Okay, so. Much sharper. Okay, now erase and say the sound. Sorry, I thought it was done. Yeah, it was done. Okay, so um, the last step is uh, just another reinforcement of letter sound knowledge and phonemic segmentation. S -o -a -p. So that's kind of going back to the earlier principle where let's read and write and manipulate sounds. That activity did all three of them because he had to read the word, he had to blend them together, he had to write them and say the sounds. And then when he's erasing it, it's another form of, manip it's a kind of a form of a manip manipulation. So is writing, I think. Any questions about that? Delia had a good question. Thank you. Let's see if I can get my slides up in the right place this time. <laughs> Got to double check with you. Um, okay, here we go. You see my iceberg? Okay, so... Remember, basic code is where we're teaching those reliable short vowel levels, one syllable. And these activities will be the, uh, they're great tools for building that reading brain, building the alphabetic principle, letter sound knowledge, phonemic segmenting, phonemic blending, phonemic manipulation, and decoding and spelling. You're knocking out all those things with these activities that integrate these things together. So if you want your kids to learn the short O tomorrow, have them do switch it and switch from mat to, to um, from mop to map and map to cap and cap to cop. That's gonna help them learn the short O. And then give them the word um, <clears throat> hop and let them read it. And then give them for write it, which is dictation, which is just as simple as having them write. Okay, I want you to read the word. I'm, I want you to write the word not. What do you hear in the word not? What's that first sound? Mm, what's the next sound? Ah, let's, oh, nope. Is that ah? That makes it nah. What would make it nah? And maybe they can figure it out. If not, I would just say, well, this is ah. This is ah. So you had the right sound. Let's put it the right symbol in there. Ah. And so what do you have to make not? What do you, what's missing? That's right. And what do you have all together? Not. Let's erase it. What are the sounds? N, ah, t. So maybe they're going to be a little bit better at the ah sound by doing switch it, read it, and write it. And then you would read passage that focuses on short O and hopefully what 
letter sounds they are short vowels they learned recently, like a review. Okay, so who, what's my standard for then moving on? Somebody, who's gonna be the fastest to type that in the chat? When do we move on? Janique, 70%, <laughs> that's right. So when they hit three, they can blend three sound words, we're gonna press ahead because there's so much advanced phonics information they have to learn. And frankly, it's, um, we, we wanna give them the, present the, code, the way their code really works as soon as possible. So we don't create misunderstandings. So once we're into the advanced code, we're gonna use these activities. The only, there's only one that's new. Now we're gonna fold in an activity called sort it. And they've got to sort because there's all the complexity of the long vowels and other advanced phonics. But we're going to still bring in write it with us. And maybe later on, when we're ready to go into multisyllable words, we will still do read it as well, but we'll do it with multisyllable words. We're not going to talk a lot about multisyllable because there's only so much I can do in an hour, but that would be the same activity that we were doing up here read it. Now we just do it later on once they're ready for multi-syllable instruction, same thing. All in connecting it. How are they going to write the word Saturday? Hopefully by now you're seeing, I'm really emphasizing how are they connecting sounds and symbols they're going to say, and they're going to say it in chunks or say it in syllables. Sat er day. And how are we going to erase it? Sat er day. So that's write it right there with the multi-syllable level. And also you could do it with read it. Okay, so now I wanna to get to the end of the, the grand finale where we're really gonna save us a lot more, even more time with sort it, okay? Sort it is like the hub that we use for uh, a system of learning a lot of phonics rapidly. Advanced Marnie, where's, fun. We're still on the basic code slide, is that okay? That's so weird, why? I mean, like I'm on the right slides, why would it? Okay, no please keep interrupting me. I'm so sorry. I don't know why. Um, so let's see there advanced code. Did you ever see advanced this one? We did not see advanced code. No. This is so glorious technology. I'm sorry. Oh, um, okay. Thank you. So, so my point right. is, but you didn't get to men, you didn't get to see this, but I was trying to say, once you get to advanced code, we're going to change our activities, but they're still going to be very similar. We're going to still connect sounds and symbols and sort it is the main new thing that we're doing. We're dragging, write it and read it up with us if we need it. So what is sort it? It's really a hub for um, learning a lot of advanced phonics. We're going to do sort it to present new information to kids like the sound O, O could be toe, O can be no, O can be note, O can be show, O can be boat. All of that information we're going to present to them and sort it. And then we're going to do other activities to reinforce that knowledge by reading, writing, and manipulating. Still back to that initial big idea. Here's an example of a sorted page. This is something we have at Reading Simplified, but you can just do this with notebook paper. All you're doing is taking one sound, not spelling. So this is a speech to print approach. So you're taking the sound O, and you're telling them, we're gonna read some words that have the sound O. And now let's find out where it goes. We gotta sort it. Do you want us to see this? Cause it's not, I'm so sorry. It's, it's not, not your not fault. I, I appreciate the interruption. <laughs> I'm so like, bad. I'm gonna try a different choice. You know, Zoom gives you choices. I'm choosing a different choice. I should have figured that out a little earlier. This is a okay. different choice. Now you can sort see it. it. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is sorted. One sound and multiple spellings. They read the word, just like they did with read it. They read the word go, then they have to decide where it belongs. And then when they write it, they say the sounds in a connected way, g -o. And if they were to read the word, if they were to write the word road, they would say the sounds um, r-o-d. So they're always connecting phonemes and graphemes, sounds and symbols. So this is going to give them a mental schema for how the code works because it's organized. How many of you have had programs for phonics where it's kind of random? It's just dripped out. One day you do ER, but you don't do IR as bird and um, UR as infer. And maybe another day you do OW and another day you do another sound. Um, that's kind of haphazard and it's disorganized and it's not very helpful. It doesn't help build um, 
um, a graphic organizer in the brain, a filing system. So sort it does. And like what I was trying to say was, you know, you don't need our papers. Just take the idea of one sound, multiple spellings, and have kids sort it by spelling. We also use a key sentence, which we made up based on high frequency. So most of those words in that key sentence go home to show the boat to Joe are high frequency words. So we're learning high frequency spellings and we're learning high frequency words. And that's like an, a mnemonic that we can use all week to kind of reinforce the sound. So we spend a week on O. We put a lot of time into sort it, but then we do ancillary activities. And the key sentence helps us keep that organized. And it makes it easier to teach too. I know all week I'm going to spend a whole bunch of time on the sound O. There are some reading programs that do this, but a lot that don't. More than often than not, it's just like all you can handle kids is OA. We're going to spend several days on OA. You can't possibly handle OW. Well, they can, especially if it's presented in a manner that's organized. So this is what I think is going on with the child's brain. They we're building a, a filing system. Oh, the sound O. Oh, it can be this, can be this, can be this from the get-go so that they can understand more than about the code and they file it away correctly. <laughs> Kim says, I used sword last year and it was mind blowing for that reason. Yeah. Um, so all the time we're doing sort of just like all the activities, it's gonna be more effective when we connect it to sound. So I've been hammering that home. It's a really big deal. It's also gonna work more when, um, you're writing it by hand. Have you seen that in all of our activities um, with read it and write it and now sort it? They say the sounds and they connect it and they're writing. Um, writing is better than even moving letters or typing on a keyboard in terms of getting the information to stick. So Courtney asks a really good question. Do you tell them when to use the different spellings? Well, what we're doing right now because this is like, remember, we just got kids to be able to blend three sound short vowel words. They're really young in their reading development. All we want them to be able to do is to recognize these words, to recognize OA when they see the word boat. And maybe when they see uh, the word float, maybe it's the first time they've ever seen the word float, but will they come up and they think, oh, I'm gonna try O here. So it's a reading goal early on. Spelling will follow along later, right? Because they have to read words multiple times before they can be expected to know which spelling goes where. So sort it is um, an activity to, to teach that OA is O and the OW is O and that OE is DO. Um, when to use it for spelling is, um, is harder and it's further down the line and it's not really our short-term goal. This activity will help them with spelling and so we'll write it. But we first want to just get them to read these words so they can get into a book like Frog and Toad or Henry and Mudge or Little Bear. But that's a common issue that comes up. So I'm glad you asked that question. So these are the features that we're driving, we're creating here at Sorted. You're going to have an organized presentation. You're going to give them this mental schema. You're going to connect things to sounds. You're going to write. And then you're going to get a lot of repetition. This is, this is really probably um, one of the key secrets for getting phonics to stick and getting high frequency words to stick. Can you give them multiple exposures in multiple contexts throughout the day? What do I mean by that? Let me break that down. So here's an example. All week you're teaching the O sound. Um, can they um, go to an, a center where they have an app or some sort of device and they... Um, study, they play a game where their focus is on the O sound and multiple spellings. And then can they go um, and listen to a center where they read a text and they follow along and there's a lot of O sound spellings. Maybe they play a game and they hold, and they, you know, hold up OA cards or flashcards even. Um, maybe they go to a computer station and they play some games where they Focus on the O sound. When they're with you in small groups, you're gonna do the sorted activity. You're gonna have them write. You're gonna have them read O sound passages. Maybe they play games. Maybe they read with a partner. All week you're getting this, you know, multiple exposures, multiple contexts. So um, this actually becomes pretty easy after all of that. It's just five little spellings. So that's how sorted is a hub. Here's an example of how um, one of our, our um, expert reading supply teachers, she took the little key sentences and blew them up and 
So she, you can see it's like a poster, like a word wall or a sound wall that she's using and having this connection. So let me show you a, an example of sort of in action. Um, before I do that, I'm going to just say one more thing. Here's an example of how the activity of sorted and the related activities is, um, must include reading passages. So here's an example from the text from inside the Reading Simplified Academy, but you could use any text that target one sound, multiple spellings. So what if a, a small group of yours was reading five passages and mastering them because they reread them multiple times and they had these spellings. Row, row, row your boat has a few O's. The one in the bottom left, Joe and Joan is one of the easier ones that we have. It's just got multiple spellings like Joe and Joan and both soap and float, go. Mary had a little lamb has a couple of O's in it, snow and go. Toad and goat on the right is a little harder. It's got Joe and toad and goat and row. Snow day with mom, it's just one page, but it's stuffed with the O sound. Snow, um, go, blows, home, hot cocoa. Cocoa has two O's. So this is part of the system where I'm saying that this sorted idea, one sound, multiple spellings, and then getting enough practice with that, including real reading, that's what's gonna make this um, phonics information stick. But how about we end with a video example of sorted and then questions? Because as always, I go long. It's not really quick enough with my Jabbering. Here, okay, here is sort it in a small group instruction. It's their second time ever doing this for struggling first grade readers. It looks the same, but they're different words. Okay, so go 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 to Wow, good work, you guys. Where does boat belong? Which column is the same spelling? As okay, someone says the boat, the video is stuck. That stinks because it was flying wrong with me. Okay, uh, was it stuck for everybody? Okay, we'll try it again. Sorry about that. Hmm. I only have one choice to share my screen. Let's see if this one works. No? It looks the same, but they're different words. Okay. Huh. So. Go, go, go. Okay. You know, you know, I'm just noticing it says that we're screen sharing. And I wonder if that's part of the problem. I'm going <clears> to. <throat> do you have, do you see how you can unscreen share? Is that when I tried to screen share earlier? Maybe? Yeah, I think I pulled it, pulled it off. So let's see if this works. One more time. It looks the same, but they're different words. Okay, so. Go. Go. Go to the show the boat to Joe. Wow, good work, you guys. Where does boat belong? Which column is the same spelling as O? Nope, check here. Well, that's so sad. I'm sorry. Um, let me show you a picture then. If you go to our website, you can get a freebie and see some examples. <laughs> um, so um, the steps are pretty simple. It's just, you coach the child to read the word. Can you see sort it now? I can't see you because of my screen. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Courtney. Um, so you coach them, hey, we're gonna read some O sound words. They may have never seen these before. They, you haven't pre-taught pre them OA, you haven't pre-taught them OW. And so you just say, let's read some sounds, words of the O sound ones. So when they get to the word road, they don't recognize OA, but it's bolded or it's a different color. And so they go, uh, oh, and you say, remember it's the O sound. And then they go road, oh, road. And then they look at the columns, where's the spelling is similar. They find it and then they write it and they connect the sounds to print. R -O -D. So they're getting that mental schema this way. Um, 
that organizational system um, and the phonics information just sticks much more quickly. So um, Courtney asked like, how do you do this whole group? You can keep everybody kind of going along whole group, but what we typically suggest is if you can do this in small groups, some kids are still at the short vowel level, right? So, but you want some kids to be moving on into the O sound. So one group might do the O sound for a whole week and another group's doing the E sound for a whole week. And so you still can have centers that are the same, like, um, if they have a, a center with a device, maybe Monday is a game called um, Ready, Set, Read. And so one group would go and pick the O sound for Ready, Set, Read when it's their turn. And they go, another group would pick the E sound. So they still play the same activities. The center is constant. So you're not reinventing the wheel each Sunday, but one group does O, another group does E, another group is still doing short vowel review. And that's just like, then, then you think about all of your centers that way, all the different ways you can pair reading. Okay. They're going to pair, this group's going to pair read the E passage that they read with you. This group's going to pair read the O passage they read with you and so forth. So that image with all the different ways of multiple exposures, multiple contexts, you just make, pull that off by thinking about wh which sound are people on. Yeah. And we have a one page scope and sequence that helps do that, but I've taken too much time, so I can't explain that. But that's how we think we're like, we're, you know, somebody's here on group, group one's down here. Somebody's uh, on step two, group two is on step two, group three and four, maybe they're on group, they're on step five and so forth. So that's how we're able to think about all these crazinesses about people everywhere, <laughs> but we're just set, centered on one sound. And we do one sound pretty much for a week at, with multiple exposures and multiple contexts and it starts to stick. So what other questions should I address? There's one in the chat, Janique. Is there a good resource that tells the frequency of the spellings? Um, I know Phonic Books has one. We have one inside the Reading Simplified Academy for members in the... Um, welcome unit, but I know Phonic Books has one publicly available. Um, Debbie Heppelwhite also has one. Um, I got mine from Fry's study that was in, I think from the reading teacher in like the eighties. That's how I devised that streamlined pathway, which, because we basically did more important spellings earlier on and, and didn't do all of them. And Diane, that's, the, that's the, the answer. The letter order is generally, generally there's other factors, but generally we're gonna go in order of high frequency. So we're gonna start beginners with A and I and M and S and T and P and maybe D. So that helps them build a lot of words that they can blend pretty easily like matte and sad. So I know we covered a lot and I had some pretty bad technology. So I just wanna reiterate Go back to the, the idea of how kids learn to read is by connecting sounds and symbols with the meaning. Linnea Airy reduced the formula to just that triangle sound-based decoding and practice. I tried to present the idea of thinking about moving from basic code to advanced code and moving quickly into advanced code so that you have a system um, and kids learn the information quickly. And um, using activities that do these things as much as possible, reading, writing, and manipulating, those are gonna be some of the secrets. So if you have choices amongst the activities in your curricula, curriculum, choose an activity where you can get them to read and maybe write, or choose an activity where they can manipulate and they're gonna be drawn to connecting sounds and symbols. So that's a framework that you can evaluate whether something is a really good, a good fit for building the decoding skills rapidly. You're kind of saying we don't need a whole bunch of extra, you know, well, bells and whistles. It's just simple. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And I think that's really important because a lot of us, like myself, when I, when I told you at the beginning of my story, we did not get really solid training. I shouldn't say for everybody, but a lot of us haven't gotten really solid training on how to teach kids to read words. And then our reading curricula just tell us to do a thousand things. And so we get overwhelmed. And that's why I'm saying, yes, there's a lot that could happen. Science is complex, but when you really boil down how to learn to read words, if you have some language, 
It's just connecting sounds and symbols, reading, writing, and manipulating words from a basic level to a more complex level as fast as you can, and then getting real text in front of them as fast as you can with a lot of coaching on how to help them through when they get stuck, help them through a word. Right. So we went over, like I said, I tend to do that. Plus I had technology problems and I'm sorry you didn't get to see the uh, video. I will put in the chat how to find that sorted video so you can see it in action. I have, I think I have a video of um, a kid doing it with one-on-one -on -one, and then I have a group active, a uh, group video there. So you can see you, an example. You mentioned you have something coming up um, oh yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, so we're gonna do this um, challenge. It's called Level Up Your Reader's Achievement in Five Days. And it is um, all about that activity, Switch It, which is one of the most powerful activities that, that we see. And every year we get people to do, um, to see massive improvements by just doing like five minutes, 10 minutes of Switch It. Um, because it's connecting sounds and symbols in a really explicit way that reveals things that kids didn't formerly know. So let me plop that in the chat. This is, um, yeah, a free five-day challenge. It'll be on Facebook Live if Facebook is functioning. <laughs> Maybe it will be on YouTube Live if it's not. Okay. Lily, um, thank you for saying that it was good. <laughs> We've got this despite the technology difficulties, very kind. And Anna says, I love the simple but rich strategies of reading simplified. It's all I use in my tutoring with very pleasing results. And Anna tutors a lot of kids. She's carrying a heavier caseload than I could handle when I was a full-time tutor. Anything else, you guys? Do you, Marnie, I did have one more question. Do you address handwriting or is that like a I mean, I know it's not separate, but do you, do you correct their handwriting as they go? Yeah, it's really wise to correct their handwriting as they go, particularly for the beginners. Um, and we have in the academy, we have a module, a separate module on it because I, I kind of okay. started reading Simplified thinking that most people had a handwriting curriculum, but then I found out that they really don't. So if you're teaching pre-K or kindergarten or first graders that, yeah, it's absolutely important. We've even seen recent research that says that um, correct formation and speed of writing letters is associated with reading fluency. So all of these sub skills that we're building into our kids' brains at the manipulative level, the writing, reading, and manipulating, all of them relate to automaticity. So you have to be automatic with segmenting. You have to be automatic with blending. You have to be automatic with recognizing letter sounds. And we even have to be automatic with writing them. But having said that, um, when handwriting is profoundly challenging, I might put it in the back seat for a child and not put all my energy in the reading lesson on it because, and probably do handwriting separately because you could, you could inject so much frustration into the lesson if right. that's, if they have, you know, They're manual, fine motor. fine motor problems, right? I did see one more question. Do you see that from Kelly? Kim says, this is a great, a good review. Great. Um, we're so glad you had here. Kelly, what is the best way to use the continuous blending technique while making sure that the uh is an added to the end of sounds? The more you can do a, a clip sound, the better. So that when you say the, the, the first letter in bat, you, you don't say buh. Um, however, it, the interesting thing is that um, there's only one study, but still one study came out and said when um, <clears throat> teachers added the buh, the, as that's what we I used to call the sloppy uh, the kids actually did better than when they were really forcing them to do it clipped like but. And their theory is that in the classroom setting that it's just kind of hard to hear. What are you talking about when when I say but? What did you just do? <laughs> but but it has a little bit more clarity. And the reason I think this is feasible for the child's brain is is and the answer is in the Mark Seidenberg's video series because. Even though I've been saying that the phoneme is the, is the individual sound and word, it's actually just an abstract concept that I have that it's the individual sounds and words. Because actually, if you look at speech streams and we record our, 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 our speaking, um, <clears throat> you cannot like look at a speech stream of the word but. Um, you can't just chop a computer speech stream up into three parts and come out with a pure b -a -t. it will actually sound like b -a -t if you try to chop it up that way because all these sounds are connected and they're not pure um one of his colleagues in that mini in that mini series that dr seidenberg did was um 
she said to say the difference, say the sound. Um, I think it was coo yes. and key. Yeah. So notice what you're doing with your mouth when you say coo, it's up here. But key is back here. The k, we think it's the same sound. But if you were to, to study it in its true segmented form, it's a different, it's slightly different. And so the reason that kind of nuance is important is that what we're building when we draw students' attention to sounds is we're actually building just, um, we're just hijacking a way to connect sounds to symbols. Like if I tell you the word road, you're gonna think this spelling in your head probably before you think um, this spelling. We're just very spelling driven and we're gonna go based on frequency. Uh, anyway, I'm not, that's not a good example. But back to this question of why might the sloppy uh not actually be an issue? It's because when I say buh, my kids are actually not, many of them aren't gonna be going buh at, they're gonna be going bat. And so uh, again, it was only one study that found it was better to have a sloppy uh, but um, I think it's interesting. And I think the reason that it, if, it, if it holds up and with more science, then um, it must be because we're, we're only creating an abstraction of what, of a reality. Um, this, um, when I say, but I'm thinking this, this thing, but it's going to be something different when I say the word bet, I guess. I don't know. Her example was coup and key. I don't know another example where the B sound would be different with a vert, with a vowel after it. Bird maybe, but we're, I'm not sure, but um, speech sounds. I'm not. I'm not doing this justice. Definitely go watch that Seidenberg video. Right. Um, but back to the question about blending per se. The key to helping them is to just make them put the first two sounds together and start out with three sound words with short vowels. So it's some, some something simple. And even if you're if they can't do it at all, then start out with a continuous consonant sound, which is like one that you can carry the sound. So put those two sounds together, sa and hold it, sa and then it becomes pretty easy for the child to blend. If your child can't do that, even after you model it for them a few times and ask them to copy you back, then um, I have a blog post about how to deal with tricky problems. I will pull that up because we do certainly have those, I, those arise, but usually that's all that it takes for your typically, typically developing kid and even some strugglers. Well, thank you, Marnie. We appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to present to us and share with us. Well, it's always it. my honor, you know, I was so, so frustrated and didn't understand why people had made it so complicated. So, right, right. And I didn't know this. Why did I not know this? I had masters, put a lot of money into that masters. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and thank you for all that you're doing, Courtney. I know it's a labor oh, of love. Yeah. I, I'm kind of a reading nerd, so I enjoy it. <laughs> well, right. if, if, um, I, you know, if you guys need some, um, ideas or if I didn't cl clear, clear something up for you, you can email me and I'm happy to answer. Here's my email. Okay. And then I'll make sure I get, once you give me the Zoom, I'll make sure I post it and email it out to our subscribers too. I know a lot of people wanted to watch it later. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All right. Thank you everyone. Good for night and good morning for those of you in Australia. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, Marnie.